just gonna wait a, a minute for people to join and get set up. All right. I think just about everybody. The numbers have stopped going up. We can get started. So hello and welcome to today's webinar by the Danish Sign Cluster. Today we are joined by two special guests from Roskilde Festival. Uh, we're recording the webinar, so we'll send it out afterwards um, in a follow-up email so you can Maybe send it on to a colleague or someone who couldn't be here today if you think it's interesting for them as well. Um, if you have any questions, you can write them in the Q&A chat. Um, yeah, or any comments, just put them in the chat as we go along and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. And yeah, today we are joined by Morten Brugger, who's the project manager, and Lars Lilienkrein, who's the head of production at Roskilde Festival. And they are going to speak about many of the uh, many aspects of sound at the festival as well as their research and their um, partnerships so thank you so much for being here today welcome and thanks to everybody in the audience for joining i will let you guys take it away thank you shelly uh it's it's good to to be here and thank you for to Danish sound cluster for uh, in morton, inviting morton and and me to to this webinar we're very excited to to tell you about some of the things that we've done uh, with working with sound at at the festival. Uh, but first off, uh, just a, a quick introduction to to Morten and myself. Um, uh, I, sk I skipped the agenda. I can see Morten. Sorry. <laughs> um, no worries. I mean, we are experts on Zoom anyway. So this is the introduction and. Uh, some of the stuff we're going to be touching on, but let me just introduce Lars to you guys. So Lars was born in Odense in 1973 and has an educational background, school teacher, background in production and touring, and volunteer and production manager at the festival since 2008. And Lars, you've been employed since 2014? Since 2014, yes. Um, full time, uh, done production since that. Uh, my background is actually uh, a, a weird one. I should mention more, and I come from, from teaching, but a uh, I've always been working with with music, uh, uh, mainly as a volunteer. And then in 2009, I became a full time touring production manager. So uh, a late change, a career change for, for me, but uh, with the festival full time since uh, 2014. Yeah. And uh, Morten, he's been with the festival since 2002. Uh, as a sound consultant, and uh, uh, it's been 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 one of the key elements in how we develop uh, uh, the audience experience at the festival. Morten's background is is sound, and he teaches sound at the Rhythmic Conservatory in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, he also uh, is a producer and and a live uh, sound engineer. Morten also works with. Um, the different research programs we have going on at Roskilde Festival with DTU, other universities, and Maya Sound. Well, thank you, Lars. Thank so you. Uh, why don't you just hop on into telling everybody about the history of the festival? Well, we're standing on, on the shoulders of, of giants. Um, uh, you may see the Roskilde logo from time to time saying uh, non profits since 1972, but actually the first Roskilde Festival took place in September 1971. It was two Roskilde uh, high school kids who were very much inspired by, um, by Woodstock and they wanted to do uh, their own festival um, in 71, and this is the 71 poster. 
uh, one of the, the big names, Gasoline. That's the only time Gasoline, Danish band, has played the festival. The festival been, has been asking Gasoline to perform at the festival, but the band never reunited after they split in the late 70s. So that sadly never happened again. But in the year one, uh, the festival, this is the main stage in 1971. But amazingly, uh, the, the first festival was actually quite a success. Um, there are 20,000 people attending the festival. There are two stages and it was over uh, two took place over two days in September. Um, sadly enough, what, what happened uh, at the first festival, sorry, there was only one stage, um, the main stage. Um, what happened at the festival was uh, there were no credit cards, there were no mobile pays or cashless systems back then, it was all cash. So um, the success of, of the first festival um, generated a lot of cash during the festival and the two high school kids they needed some place to store uh, the, the money the turnover happening during during the festival. And a good friend of them uh, offered to to store the money in his car. And, and after the festival, he, uh, he drove off, but he didn't hit to Copenhagen where he was supposed to go. He went to Hamburg and was gone. So after year one, the fest festival was actually close to, to being bankrupt. Uh, the profits from the first year were gone. This, this led uh, on to that uh, the two young high school students were approached by the, uh, the Roskiller Foundation. The Roskiller Foundation is an old foundation uh, from Roskiller with the main purpose of helping uh, young people and children in need. They're actually uh, part of op opening the third kindergarten in Denmark in the 1930s. They approached the two students and suggested that uh, the, the Roskiller Festival should become a non-profit organization with the main purpose of uh, um, making a profit to be donated to charity. Yeah. And from there on, it, it, it kicked off in 1972. Um, and being the Roskiller Festival non-profit, and we have... Uh, just had our 50th festival in 1922. Sadly, we had to, to cancel the two years during uh, Corona in 2021. But right now, Ros for this year, Roskiller Ros Festival, we will be presenting more than 200 bands on seven stages. The festival kicks off with opening of the campsite end of June and then goes on for eight days uh, and is attended by more than 130,000 people people. It only takes us around two to three weeks to build the site. And uh, this, the, the field we just saw is turned into uh, the fourth largest city in Denmark. So what we do is actually build the fourth largest city in Denmark. And what is very special about uh, the Roskiller organization is that we have a lot of uh, volunteers uh, joining our organization, also volunteers who work throughout uh, the whole year in different management positions. They do all from security, uh, running running beer sales, uh, doing stage build up and production. So, so be, the volunteers um, are our core element of of doing the the Roskiller Festival. We have roughly around twenty nine thousand uh, volunteers at the festival. Uh, so volunteering is an important part of, of Roskiller Festival. We also have professional companies uh, uh, joining us for, for various uh, tasks on site. Throughout the history of Roskiller Festival, this is a special poster we made with an example of uh, some of the recipients of uh, our donations, different NGOs with the main purpose of uh, uh, doing a change uh, for the good or uh, helping young people and children in need. Um, right now, I think we have managed since 1972 to donate around 400 million Danish krona, which is, comes close to uh, close to 50 million uh, euros so far. At the festival, we strive to create communities. Uh, bringing people together is one of the core elements at the festival. And that happens through uh, or activism program, arts program, and music uh, program. We also have a, a main focus on uh, sustainability, 
and we have different uh, activities going on on site with uh, a circular lab and, and different aspects of uh, sustainability. We have a comprehensive activism program with talks also happening at the festival. There again, one of the nice uh, volunteers we just saw with the volunteer manifest, which uh, is, is uh, the heart of the festival, uh, how we work together. Uh, it can be found online. Um, just go and look for the volunteer manifest at roskiller-festival.dk. Well, great. Uh, moving into sound production in previous years, Lars. How did that look? Yes, before um, 2018, we had we had uh, different Danish companies coming in, uh, each student doing a stage. Uh, we we more or less uh, were provided with what was available on on the shelves, which was fine. Um, one of the challenges that we're facing is that uh, Oscula Festival takes place uh, at the farmers market in Roskilde. It's it's a site which is roughly 1400 uh, times 800 meters large which is a fairly small site if you want to fit in seven stages and seven stages doing sound is a challenge so we we did have some issues with 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 noise bleed and uh, um, sometimes the the wind being heavy during the summer coming in from the west so so we felt like that we needed some sort of optimization for uh for, for sound uh, and the audience experience at the festival. This, um, this, this was more or less, there were no bad intentions, but, but there wasn't uh, a, a top view of the festival. Uh, each stage was uh, did, dealt by individually, uh, by stage production and by, by the suppliers coming in. Yeah, and then I can speak about the new paradigm that uh, came out of uh, all the talks that I've had throughout the years. Uh, the vision would actually be to get what would be optimal and have that talk instead of getting what we were able to get. So what, what is actually needed? And also, how do we develop what we do? Uh, a strong focus, as you saw, of the festival's core is the mindset of, of creating communities that also develops people and uh, how, to, how to stand out in a very communal way. Uh, the objective was then to find a partner with shared values who could provide the technological solutions. Basically, uh, my question to the festival, I believe actually last, this was before you were hired, I asked the management at the festival, um, or I advised them, I said, maybe you should find a, a manufacturer, a product that could provide product development instead of just a vendor which would then lead to shared goals of R&D and uh, optimize, uh, optimize results that we couldn't get just by purchasing or renting gear somewhere else. In turn, that turned into be a collaboration with uh, the American uh, speaker manufacturer called Maya Sound, based in California. And uh, the how the nuts and bolts of this arrangement is, is kind of like this. So, uh, Maya Sound designs the systems. Uh, Roscoe the Festival obviously provides the framework for all the seven stages. Uh, a local supplier is, uh, has the, the main uh, engagement in, in getting all the equipment to the festival, sub-renting if they don't have what they need. And then we, as a festival, uh, takes on the task to hire on sound engineers and also teach and develop those people uh, uh, taking part of it. We also do a lot of research uh, and try to disperse as much knowledge as I can. On the right-hand corner, you see uh, the logo from the institution that I work at uh, on my everyday job, RMC, Rhythmic Music Conservatory. And DTU has provided uh, student projects for this uh, collaboration throughout the years. So how do we actually work with developing and, and challenging the mindset of everyone involved? Uh, because uh, I think it's a strong foundation or a daring move also to say that we don't own the rights to defining what a great festival experience is, but it's a communal uh, cooperative, cooperative uh, uh, endeavor, basically. 
Uh, so some, some of the stuff that we try to teach everybody involved is these three, the tripod model of technological, artistic, and social processes. In the technological knowledge, we have physics and acoustics that we work with. There's also psychoacoustics and psychophysics, and then there's the, the equipment and designs. Our partner, Maya, Maya, Sound, Maya Sound, provides a whole lot of knowledge on this field because that's what they're experts in. Um, the artistic process is somewhat, you could frame that as a, a belonging in between the festival and Maya Sound because uh, maybe they have an objective of being a transparent loudspeaker company, but transparent is not necessarily what the artist needs or desires. So there's a, a, a strong focus on how we communicate about what we actually are trying to achieve. And the fun thought experiment is also extremely scary to think of uh, if we gather 50,000 people in front of our stage, nobody knows if the concert will, will be a success or if it's even going to work, there will be music, but will this be something that people can like? Is it available in an emotional sense to the audience and so forth? And what does that do? The strong part of the festival, what the, the festival actually are experts in, is the social process. Uh, so we take on an American company with different culture and set of values. And uh, they have to interact with Danish engineers and international acts and their engineers. And everything has to work together. That resulted in us teaching a lot of role clarification, uh, teaching them about conflict resolutions and how to build trust. So this is a team effort. And the most stellar uh, aspect of that, or the, where, the, where this comes to light, is the handover process on the festival. So everything is built up, all the stages are built, uh, the PA is installed, and then comes the handover where uh, Maya Sound and Victory, the vendor, says, okay, the, P the system is ready for the festival. And uh, previous years, it was kind of like uh, I was listening to the PAs and saying, okay, the, the coverage is even and, and so forth. But I immediately recognized with having a, a experts in the room, like beyond experts, basically, because they do this for a living every day year round. Uh, why don't we ask them, or why don't we ask everybody what they think about the sound? So when we do the handover process now, it's kind of like, kind of a circle of trust where we invite everybody to share their opinion. Even people who doesn't know anything about sound on a professional level are invited in if they're around, or maybe the the first act playing or a stage. Their engineer, we we asked uh, them a couple of times. What do you think about the sound of the PA system? Is this what you would want, or do you desire something else? So we invite to a very open dialogue, uh, and that's part of this uh, building trust and also establishing the team mentality. Everybody plays a part in the festival. I collected a, a series of uh, overview of the, the different research projects that's been going on. This actually been going on before we had the Maya Sound uh, partnership. But just to show you guys, and I'm doing this really fast, but uh, maybe you can just fast read through all of this. A lot of stuff have been dealt with crosstalk or effects of weather. Uh, but from 18 and onwards, where we had the first year of Maya Sounds in 18 and from 19, more and more focus has shifted into uh, discussion on how to actually optimize uh, the different role perspectives or the different ways that we work together because we have such clarity in the PA systems now. So, daringly said, we have unsurpassed audio quality for the audience at Roskiller Festival. As you might remember from Lars's points about how it was in previous years, maybe the same PA vendor was at the room or at the stage, sorry, two to three years at a time. Now we have a, a five-year deal, so to say. So it's a role of five years, five years of expertise. So from year one to year two, there's a huge improvement because people return to the same stages instead of just shifting around or, and we can work with quality and, and uh, evaluation on a totally different way. Uh, the research projects are more focused. Uh, because we actually uh, 
open up for, you can apply for a job at the festival. That actually changed the gender segmentation of the, of the freelance sound engineers. From 1972 or 71, all the way up until 2017, uh, there was no female sound engineers working at the festival. And from 18, we had five out of a total of 40. So everything will, as, is changing because you don't have access. Uh, you, you, you didn't have access previous years. Now you have access because you're on, a, on the same level. So that opened up. We even had persons from uh, the Middle East and from South America apply. Uh, some were higher, some were not. But that's a different discussion. And the education spans across different borders, experiences, and ages, which is also this thing about creating a communal experience where everybody takes part on an equal level. So uh, the, the weird thing about uh, hierarchy is that we it's kind of dissolved at Roskilde. It is there, but you can maybe imagine having volunteers working with professionals. How do you authorize each other to actually have a say in what you do? Uh, it's a fine line, but we have to have create an open community to have for everybody to take part of that. And by that, motivation and sense making is at the core of what everybody does and has to project, basically. Lars. Yes. Um, I, I did see one question pop up, but I think we'll do, do the questions at, uh, at the end. Um, what's the next thing happening is that, that I know uh, um, Danish Sound Cluster has sent out uh, some info about uh, a day at Roskiller Festival, the 26th of June, where uh, you can apply. And it, if you're a member of Danish Sound Cluster and it's possible to, to visit Roskiller Festival, um, what will happen at Mon on Monday the 26th is that uh, yeah, you, of course, will get to, to listen to, to some of the systems we have up and running. We got two stages playing on the 26th, uh, EOS and Gaia. Um, and then you will also uh, get to meet some of the, uh, the people working at Roskiller Festival. We have a circular lab, which is a laboratory where we invite startup uh, uh, companies to, to join the festival. They mainly have um, a, a focus on circular business models. And you will also get to meet uh, our head of partnerships, Andreas Kort Clausen. We're all very interested in partnering up with with uh, with companies and and people who are interested in in creating something different at Roskiller Festival Festival and elevating what we do at the festival. And Maya Sound is a, is a great example of a, a partner we we brought in who has taught us a lot about the festival. Um, to, to, to make an even better event out of what we do. So, so hope to see uh, many of you on site. Yeah, it's been off of that. I can also uh, speak about the way that we have a sound policy. So uh, not, in Denmark, we don't have regulations in the governmental body as to how loud you are able to play for audience. There's only rules for neighbors and working persons. So, uh, I believe it actually back in 2002 or maybe 2003, the festival set out to tr figure out how how loud is the festival action? How fast are we going, so to say? So we measured each concert three times with a handheld meter. There wasn't really a computer to do that at that time. One person uh, close to the festival actually working on one of the stages uh, was actually starting to be a, an engineer and his final product became the product that uh, is now used at all stages at the festival. Also internationally, it's called 10 Easy. Uh, so the festival kind of provides a test bed if the right project arises. And uh, I think that's also one of the what's next questions is what could come out of any kind of discussion or pr project product talks or need discoveries. Yeah. Is that, uh, do you know Marcel Puck? from DB Control. It's his question there. What's the challenge okay. with the SPL at the neighbor's place? I don't know if you worked together before. That's why I'm asking. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Uh, I, don't, I have a ah, screen, okay. so, so Mar uh, Marcel Koch from uh, DB Control is his company, yeah. and he has been working with uh, noise levels on, yeah, in various large festivals across yeah. Europe um, and joined us for a webinar a while ago called Make Listening Safe, but he is asking uh, about what was the challenge with SPL uh, for your neighbors? 
but um, we're, we're um, we have um, we work together with uh, the municipality of, of Roskilde. There are there are monitoring outside of of the festival site. Um, um, they're, they're monitoring or or, or spill, and um, they lock it. And at every stage, we also use a ten easy system, uh, and and we have a fairly good control of of a spread. Of course, we do. We you're able to hear the Ross Kelly Festival, but uh, the amount of complaints we get every year is is quite small. And our main fo focus is actually on, uh, we have 60,000 kids uh, mainly staying on uh, on the campsite and it's actually helping them, advising them on how to use their, their boxes they bring in. So that's actually uh, um, one of the, the, it's not a big challenge, but it's one of the, the, the few areas where we do get complaints from neighbors it's actually from from uh, sound spill from 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 the campsite but again the amount of complaints we receive is very little we've been there for more than 50 years so people in Roskilde festival are also um, aware of that there is a festival happening and uh, there is a uh, an enormous love to the festival from from the people in Roskilde but Having said that, we also have an obligation to 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 make it a good experience also for our neighbors to be near a festival. So so we do work closely with the municipality of Roskilde in monitoring uh, sound from the festival. Did yeah. that answer your question? Marcel may want even more detail than that. I feel <laughs> the specifics, how many decibels and where, <laughs> where was the problem? But what exactly do you do to, uh, how do you guide people with their sound boxes? How can you control thousands of inebriated? Um, we, we, we have teams on the campsite with, uh, with uh, small systems to able to measure. Okay. And, and then we have hosts on on the campsite who will who will talk to the different camps. Um, so that that's that's all 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 we can do, and that is what we do um, on the campsite. Do you also have specific areas of the campsite where, like, quiet zones? Yes, we example? do. Yeah. Okay. So we have quiet countries. areas, but 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 again, we we have a. a um, a young crowd coming in on the Saturday who's been look, looking forward to the festival for a whole year and um, they have a good time, time at the campsite and we try to to help them to to have it in a in a safe and a good environment also yeah. for sound when you say Saturday you mean the one before yeah uh, the youngsters Saturday, that are coming the, for <laughs> the, 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 the 24th we opened the campsite and then we have uh, two first days uh, stages playing from the Sunday. Yeah, okay. So I, can, I can maybe add to, to yeah. be more specific on the measuring method. We use a, a 15 minute LEQ value of, of A weighted uh, measurements. Uh, and we figured out during the first couple of years, maybe three years when we measured back in 2002 until 2005, when we had the first systems that uh, what would was perceived in a broader sense as a good show was kind of hitting 101, maybe 103. So we settled to make it of a musical event where we take, take into account that uh, it can get loud, but it can also get soft sometimes. So 15 minutes at moving average yeah, for 15 minutes. And the, the number that we uh, restrict people to play is 103 dB. But it's a reading, it's a measurement device. It's not an active system that deteriorates the sound or uh, does anything to it. So uh, that, that's also why we instruct or teach our uh, RF techs, as we call them, not radio frequency techs, but vascular festival that's techs, tech. <laughs> to, to handle the discussion at the console, because it should not become a problem in a discussion. You're too loud. No, I'm not. It should more be of a, a joint event. And on the flip side of all this, that's also a, a safety issue if the sound is too low. Uh, there was an accident at Roskilde in 2000 where some of the speakers actually failed and there's a large push. Maybe some of you remember that. So uh, there's a safety issue in order to be playing at a, at a good enough or loud enough level where people are entertained but not uh, gotten their heads ripped off. One more thing to add to this, which is actually a new dimension that we haven't really handled well yet. We will in, in some time. 
But uh, since systems are so clear and so transparent, all the way down to 20 and maybe even below 20 hertz, uh, musical styles has also changed. And the use of, uh, especially within the urban genre of 808s or very, very low intense sound, low frequency intense music, uh, the measuring device of measuring A weighted is not the same anymore. So since the music also changes for the behavior of the crowd and the behavior of music and the content of music is changing, uh, the festival also needs to adapt. So that's uh, a main focus in the coming years of how to actually maintain a safety level that actually adheres to the musical content more so than just a fixed DB level. Okay, so you mean that um, music with a lot of very low frequency content will measure higher, but actually it's not that loud, so you can play it louder? Other way around, you don't measure the same <laughs> volume. So uh, maybe the vocal will sit I see. at the same level, but the low end will be much more frequent, much more loud. So but that's not necessarily, okay. So not, yeah, so our measuring method right now is not uh, on par with how music is changing. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, but maybe that but, um, low frequency energy isn't going to damage people's hearing in the same true, way. So it's not. But it might yeah. make people very yeah. nauseous, especially up front. And we have a, a yeah. responsibility for people working in the crowd safety area, uh, the guards up front. Uh, so, yeah, the, it, it's a multifaceted, multi dimensional yeah. <laughs> problem. Yeah, a lot of things to think about. Uh, okay, we have a bunch of questions here in the in the Q and A. This one is from Diogo Pereira. What metrics and values do you use as limits and criteria? We might have covered that. I think so. Right, you're 101. Yeah. 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 Um, how migrating to a digital signal distribution, Mylan affected your work. That's from Francesco. Does it make sense? That's a that, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. That's a very specific question that's actually out of my reach. And maybe last that would be directed at Thais Rommel, our audio production yeah. manager. Who's sadly not present today, but uh, um, I'm 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 not in into to to understanding the, the, the full width of uh, of the Milan, but I know people are pleased. <laughs> <laughs> poor, poor, poor answer. Sorry. <laughs> Just a thumbs up. <laughs> uh, so, a question from Eric: Do you also measure at neighbors yourself, or is that only done by the local municipality? It's mainly done by 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 the municipality. At the, there, there aren't any sound restrictions uh, in 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 Roskilde, uh, and we have a, a a good collaboration with the municipality. So we share data and and cross data. To look in uh, when if if a complaint comes in, what had happened at one of the, one of the stages? Could it be a stage, or or does it come from somewhere else on the festival, the campsite? So there's a really good uh, and trustful collaboration with the municipality of Roskilde. So they do most of of the measuring outside of the site. Okay, I can add to that as well. Uh, uh, the closest. Uh, uh, residencies to the festival is actually just after a freeway or a highway. So the noise from the highway is often louder than the contribution from the, from the PA systems. So uh, in previous years with point source systems, we typically had a lot of noise complaints because it was really fluctuating how clear, clear the sound was. But now with line arrays and more focused ar arrays, it's much more precise and the quality comes through at a distance, just lower. So a lot of people I've spoken to have referred to it as having listening to a transistor radio on a very low level instead of just a loud, low end uh, fluctuating lot. All right. And Diogo again said, thanks, Morton. Are limits set for mixing position only? Do you have limits at the neighboring premises? Very uh, interesting. Uh, so we measure a front of house, the mixing console, uh, which should, should be representative. And uh, one of the key advances from having the partnership with Maya Sound is that uh, we can actually trust what they show us in the pre-production. They have this uh, uh, 
I believe it's called MAP3D, where we can map out frequency response, frequency dispersion, and volume as well. So within, let's see, let's say six decibels, maybe you will have even coverage in at least 90 to 90, 95% of the area, which is a huge advantage. And it's actually uh, what you see is what you get. So whenever they predict that thing and also improve that from year to year, uh, we can actually trust that the front of house will be representative to some extent. But of course, you could also have a discussion of having different areas to, to measure in. Um, Maybe, maybe it's also important to stress the fact that in Denmark, we have this really, really ingrained, ingrained idea of common sense. This should, make, this should work for most people. So there's nobody telling everybody to play 103, except for the largest status because of security. So we actually have a lo the lowest level to be able to play at, which is also a very uh, point of discussion between the Festival crew, Maya Sound, and the visiting engineers. There's all, a lot of stress going into high energy, high performance uh, performances when it's uh, when when we are actually in show. So we stress the fact that everybody talks every every uh, detail through before the show begins. That way, it's much easier to work with. Yeah. Um, how do you actually? How do you? Like how much time do you get with these visiting engineers when they come in to have that discussion? <laughs> it's, it's, it's very different. Some, some come in uh, uh, at night or uh, in, in the morning and we do have a, a lot of time uh, with them and, and other mainly pretty much fly in and uh, are in front of house 30 minutes before the show. Uh, but but it's one of the, th the 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 things that we've gained a lot from uh, from hiring our own uh, front of house people is that that we have we we have spent a lot of time on on training and teaching them actually in 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 what we could call the softer values communication uh, psychology um, and and also in what we as a festival strive to to create at the different stages. So there are there are advocates uh, for the festivals, and they do engage in a in a constructive uh, dialogue with the visiting front of house te technicians. So so at Roskiller Festival, um, we we try to create a situation at uh, front of house where we work together on creating the best possible show with. Maya sound assistant in engineers and all front of house people and uh, the visiting front of house engineer. And that's uh, really, I would say for, for, for most situations that works really well. And I believe that we create uh, much better audience experiences in, in, in this setup. And probably a much nicer working environment. I'd imagine. Yes, yes, because we, we're all in it for the, for, for the same and, and, and we're on, on the same side. So, so the tennis system shouldn't be seen as a restriction, but a, as a, a tool, how, how, how you can manage your show when you're visiting Roskilde Festival. And you also communicate with them in advance of the festival. I mean, the yes, visiting yes, engineers, do. because you don't know if you're going to get that time with them. So do you? Uh, uh, depends on who, who's, who's, who's uh, doing the advance for, for the artists. Sometimes it's a production manager. Uh, from time to time, uh, a front of house engineer will, will jump in in the conversation. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, can, I just heard stories. I know I can imagine there are still some engineers that just want to do it their way and, and you have to handle that with limited time and under pressure. Well, <laughs> yeah, it is under pressure, but but imagine this. Uh, so if you go to a concert venue, there's one band playing. They've had the entire day to set up. There's, everybody's focusing on every one thing. At a festival, there's 200 plus bands in a very limited amount of time. So it's, it's a live event and um, uh, you don't know what's going on. But you can just hope. So it might be self-explanatory that it's, it would make sense to stress this idea of it's a team event, but uh, we really want people to feel welcome because we believe that that's the, the way to lower anxiety when there's high pressure going on. Yeah. So wouldn't everybody would want to come into something, something that's nice or be greeted in a really nice way and here's your cup of coffee. How are you doing? How was last night's show? And all this chit chat actually opens up a lot of, Parameters because everybody know 
the role clarification of what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. So it's really only that one external engineer that you have to manage between the rest of you. Yeah, help out in the best way possible. Yeah. And um, how I know we have other questions, but I have one last one um, about the the training process for your own engineers. When does that start and how you said you keep them over several years? But I mean, do you if you don't have all of that stuff set up, when does the training happen and where and how do you? Yeah. So the, the training this spring has taken place over three days or sorry, five days, two days in February, two days in April and one day in May. Mm -hmm. And there's been different focuses. Uh, one has been in multi-channel uh, audio. One has been what is an instrument seen from a, a more of a, a research level on what does uh, instruments in Indonesia actually bring to the table and how does that transfer into new instruments? We also had a talk with uh, a, a psychologist who shared his view on uh, what the artistic process actually looks like. And then we interviewed some musicians on what they actually need and use that as a shared platform for uh, figuring out. So that's what they're saying. Is that what they're getting? Or should we improve or change what we do? Uh, but we do that in an open communication, an open way of, of speaking together. Yeah, OK. Because nobody, and... the answer. because nobody what? Nobody holds the answer to the, uh, there's not one solution, but there's a multitude of solutions. Yeah. Uh, and it's very personal because we're also using freelance engineers. Uh, so we want to inspire them to think differently or creatively about what they do and how to achieve the results that they do. And that, that also entails them going out into the world uh, the rest of the year and doing shows. Yeah. So everybody wins in this approach. But do they really have time to kind of um, work together during live sound and learn from each other before the festival happens? Yes, they sign up for the, for for the that part. We we stress the fact, of course, we cannot uh, say, uh, oh, by the way, you sh you must come to this. But we uh, there's a small fee involved also for those days, mm -hmm. so it's probably seen. I hope so. Seen as some kind of a extra activity that they can't purchase on their own anywhere else is very exclusive but it builds a unique team of 40 individuals who also the rest of the year share jobs in between each other oh i can't make it that weekend can you maybe sub in for me yeah so we're trying to create this community within the community yeah of people reaching out to each other which also in a freelance sound engineer perspective hopefully helps on uh, mental health issues if you're kind of stressed or if you don't know how, know how to tackle a certain issue uh, there's a group of uh, like-minded uh, experienced professionals who can you can reach out to yeah sounds amazing uh okay we have some more questions here one from michael nielsen how dedicated are the artists regarding the sound quality of their concerts do they have individual preferences for example frequency balance level i failed the last line of what you said frequency balance Frequency response frequency. or, yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, but most artists bring their own engineer with whom they practice the show somewhere. Maybe they have yeah. a pre-production, uh, rented a room and have their own console because the consoles are so cheap now. Back in the day, it was one console at each stage and you had a very quick changeover and one, two, three, that's the show. So now everything is prepped uh, and... Uh, I believe, I strongly believe people are hired, um, the, the front of house engineer for a certain band is hired because of their taste, their aesthetics, their ability, and also the trust issues that goes into, at least I know that guy back there in the room uh, will help me out, come out, uh, come out to the audience in the best way possible. So yes, I, I'd say they're very picky. Yeah. <laughs> uh... Okay, how long do they have to, to switch over a console? Lars, you want to uh, <laughs> talk about that? <laughs> how long time they have to switch to, to a console? Yeah, They're... switch over. I didn't realize everybody was switching desks in the at a festival as well. Um, well, that... any, any, anything from, 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 the, from the changeover, which can be anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes and and sometimes even longer depends on 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 the production plan. Yeah, but still but not if, long to get everything. 
No, but but, yeah. but if you if you're on your own console, um, it's you're faster. It, you're faster, or otherwise we we do it once with which consoles we have at the festival, and at the moment at the moment most of them are uh, Yamaha CL fives, and that's actually because they are very easy to work on, and it's easy to find one near you where you can produce a show file and bring to the festival. I see. From from our experience, we can always talk about different brands. Uh, but th but that's the choice that we made uh, out of our experience that that uh, it's it's pretty pretty accessible. Thank you very much. So the we have a question from Nina, not specifically related to measuring design for a festival, but to Roskilde Festival. At the beginning of the webinar, I paid attention to your background experience, so that's where my question comes from. As an assistant project manager of a festival in Eastern Europe and English speaker, I am interested in what you would single out as the main advantages for someone who wants to apply to work at the festival here at Roskilde. <laughs> it is enough. Is it enough to apply for a job or is it necessary to have worked in the Danish festival industry before? No, it's not necessary to have worked in a Danish festival industry or at any festival at all. Um, a, a lot of our organization is, is based on volunteers. Um, I have uh, a, my part of the volunteer uh, um, organization is called program production, and it consists on, of 15 teams, uh, seven of them running stages uh, with 15 team managers. They're all volunteers working throughout the year. And uh, in, in, in total, in my part of the organization, there are around 2,200 volunteers. Who mainly work at stages they're not doing security they're building the stages they're, they're, they're planning how to run the stages and they run the stages dur during the festival we also bring in professional technicians for for light and, and sound and imax but we do have have many uh, volunteer positions and anyone is field uh, is, is free to apply to uh, volunteering uh, or volunteer program at roskiller festival or if you're cheeky enough, you can find me on LinkedIn and mail me directly. If if you're interested in 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 volunteering at the festival, um, most most of the professionals working at the festival come in through suppliers or our own RF Tech program. Um, so so it's I would say if if you decide to go to Roskilde Festival, being an English speaking person is not a problem at all. All information in in at the festival is in Danish and in English, so it's it's pretty easy. And English is uh, spoken in Denmark uh, almost as a second language, so it's quite easy to get along. But do bring an open mindset and don't be afraid to ask questions. That's how you learn and we learn. Wow, it's hard to imagine how you can uh, manage so many volunteers. Well. We we built an organization with volunteers since '72. So uh, again, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, and it's not nothing that we invent from year to year. And and many of our volunteers have been doing the festival for many years. My I I have an assistant helping me out. She's been doing the festival for around 30 years, I think. Um, and, and she's volunteering and, and I my guess would be that she's doing somewhere in between uh, 400 and 500 hours of volunteering a year. Wow. That must be unique to Roskilde Festival, right? It, it, it is unique and it, 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 it does create a, a, um, a different atmosphere at the festival because our volunteers are also a big part of uh, the audience and how we do the, the the festival and the mindset that we have. Wow, I'm a bit yeah shocked. How many people are employed by Roskilde Festival? Uh, full time <laughs> em employed by by the Roskilde Foundation. We're around a hundred, but we also do uh, shows throughout the year. Not where we are a promoter, but where we provide uh, crowd safety management or rent out some of our. Uh, fencing and power solutions that that we own we have okay. i think we have three or four full-time uh, employed electricians who who do shows as electricians throughout the year for for live nation and and other promoters okay
Did we lose audio? Are you, uh, Shelly? Can you hear me now? Now. Great. Now it's back on. Sorry about that. Um, I forget what I was going to ask you next. Yeah, about your, what were we just speaking about? Uh, we were speaking about volunteers. And how many employees you actually have. <clears throat> uh, I, yes. Yes, you mentioned before the tech program. Is that something that is available on the uh, on your website? Can we read more about that? I think you called it the RF tech program. Uh, it's not. It's not on the website, but but uh, we're we're at when we open up uh, uh, for for twenty four, we're we're happy to share through uh, with you um, uh, at Danish Sound Cluster as well uh, what's happening. But I recommend that you visit the Roskilde Festival uh, website. Um, there are there are there is a a, a section for uh, with jobs available at the festival, and okay. it should be, be be you can find it there. But and it's if, not shared on the website. No, but if you sign up to the newsletter or follow you on a specific channel, would that be a good way to to find out when that opens up? That that, that would be a good way. Uh, following Roskiller Festival on LinkedIn, um, I would recommend that. Yeah, perfect. We can uh, include a link in the follow up email afterwards. Great. Um, before we wrap it up, I would like to go back to the, the partner event you mentioned already. Um, this is something we decided uh, that it would be great to work on together because well, Danish Science Cluster also shares a lot of the same uh, values as Roskilde Festival. So we are holding this uh, partner, I think we call it a sound innovation partner event on the 26th of June. And if you want to be part of that, you can um, check out our website and there's a whole page about it and there's a very short application you have to fill in. This is primarily for Danish audio companies, but there might be a few spots for some international companies if you're interested in joining. Um, and the deadline for that is gonna be the week after next, 11th of June, I think we wrote. So please get your application in as soon as possible if you haven't already sent it. And yeah, is there anything else you'd like to mention that we haven't spoken about today, Lars and Morten? I think we covered most of the ground of, of what is very interesting or maybe unique to this, but uh, I believe also it's uh, you have to come see it for yourself if you're interested in, in getting to know not just what we promise or speak about, but uh, what it actually is. We actually have a couple of uh, questions. Oh, more questions from Ina. Does the arrangement on the 26th require a festival ticket or wristband? I can answer that. It does not. It will be provided, but not everybody who signs up will get a place. Uh, so we have yeah, limited places available, but if you sign up now, you'll have a, a better chance than if you sign up the day before. Um, but that will be included for the day, right? Everyone will be able to join for the full program and then listen to the music until 1 a.m. that night. Question from Eric. When there is a complaint, do you respond to the person doing the complaint immediately or at least within a couple of hours, or do they get a message weeks later after research? It, it depends on who, who the complaint is uh, directed to. Um, if if it's directed to directed to the festival, the festival will respond, and this often happens during the festival because we will also investigate if if uh, what the situation is. Uh, if it's by the municipality, I think it does take some more time. Thank you, and another one from Mikael. Guys, Liza Morton, and thank you, Shelley. That was so interesting. Thank you very much for a very interesting insight. Well, that's a nice way to, <laughs> to wrap it up. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Like I said, we'll share the recording afterwards and uh, contact information from Martin and Lars. So uh, please get in touch if you have any 
further questions or you want to get involved with Rust Killer Festival somehow, and we'll try to provide all of the links you will need um, to get access to the right information. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Martin and Lars, and um, we'll see you Thank on you. the 26th for, <laughs> for those out there who are joining for that event as well. And thanks to, uh, to to all of you for joining us. And thank you, Danny Soundcluster, for hosting. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Bye.